Hello, and welcome to the Collider Podcast. I'm Collider Senior Editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is Managing Editor Adam Chitwood. Howdy, folks. Today, we will be talking about why theaters are dead and doomed and going to burn. <laughs> no, no, we're talking about... <laughs> we're talking about the uh, the big Warner Brother Warner Media uh, HBO Max deal uh, that has sort of sent Hollywood into a tizzy. If you haven't caught this news, basically what happened is that Warner Media, which is owned by AT and T, decided that for 2021, all of the movies that they were going to release in 2021 will now be released. released on day and date on theatrical and on HBO Max simultaneously. Um, this has caused major waves. Um, Christopher Nolan uh, was less than thrilled and called HBO Max the worst streaming service, which it's not. I mean, <laughs> it's not just true. objectively not, but he was making a point, not a consumer recommendation. Um, basically, the idea is a lot of creatives are unhappy because there's been no buy-in for this. Uh, that Warner Media clearly just decided unilaterally to make this deal. Um, and what that means is a lot of creatives who expected their movies to be seen on the big screen or, and, and you know, not just the magic of cinema, but there's like profit participation in here as well. Um, there's residuals. There's like, oh, if this movie performs so well in theaters, I get a cut. But now that's all been muddled by the fact that Warner Media has essentially cut into their own box office by shuttling some viewers straight into their HBO Max platform, and consume and uh, or creatives don't really see the uh, revenues from subscriptions. <laughs> Other players might, you know, depending on their what deals they've worked out with HBO Max, um, but also. You know, the, it's easy to sort of break down into factions like, oh, HBO Max is doing the right thing. This streaming is the future or, you know, Christopher Nolan is right. And you know, theatrical is where we need to put our support. And it's it's not really about all of that. There's a lot to consider. And obviously, social media is like kind of the worst place to get into it because there's a lot of factors here. So we're going to dig into all of that. And we're also going to talk a bit about what Disney announced yesterday in terms of their streaming plans. We're not going to talk individually about all 50 things they announced because we're just not. But we're going to talk about how their strategy differs from HBO and sort of what this all means for the theatrical experience and what it means for streaming. Uh, so I guess I'd start off by asking Adam, you know, what were your initial thoughts when when this deal was announced? I mean, I was kind of like you, like it, it makes sense. I mean, first of all, this is so like the vaccine is on the way. The hope is that, you know, uh, the large majority of people who want the vaccine can get the vaccine by next spring, early summer, hopefully. Um, but I'm with you. Like, you know, we don't necessarily know exactly how it's going to roll out, roll out. There will probably be kinks, which means that, you know, when Black Widow opens in May, it's possible that the consumer confidence is not there yet for everyone to go back to theaters. But some people will. Um, and then hopefully I think I would optimistically say by next fall. It feels like we will be back to some sort of new normal, um, which would increase that consumer confidence. But I don't know. I, I was with you in that, like, it does make sense to kind of hedge your bets in 2021 and not call it a lost year, but try and kind of straddle the line. Um, but like, I mean, looking further into it, once it was revealed that they had not discussed this with any of the filmmakers involved, nor with any of the distributors. So, like, you you have to wonder how much money they're so you like studios have to pay a fee to put their movie in a theater and theaters are going to be like, you know, you're going to have to pay us an astronomical amount of money in order to get us to, to show this because uh, it's also going to be on HBO max. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I had kind of mixed feelings about it. I think that for some movies it makes sense, but like for Dune, which is coming out next October, like that's, you know, that's still a long way off. It feels like we'll be in some kind of, I mean, I think Denis Villeneuve put out a statement um, today, we're recording this on Friday, that I think was really um, smart and and he made some good points. It, you know, he acknowledged that streaming is definitely a positive for some things. But in the case of Dune, like his whole idea was that that's a franchise. And now if you're kneecapping the box office receipts of it by putting it on HBO Max at the same time, the potential for it to get a sequel is now lower. Because you also have to wonder, now you have to rely on the studio to decide, like, what is their measure of success? What is their metric of success? Um, you know, also, what does that mean for movies like Judas and the Black Messiah, which seems like it's going to be a huge Oscar contender? Um, 
and I think they're releasing that early this year. So it'll probably go the way of this year's Oscar contenders, which is to say nobody knows anything because none of them went to theaters and the whole like buzz cycle doesn't exist anymore when it just kind of goes on VOD or on streaming like that. So I don't know. That's a long winded way of saying I have mixed feelings about it. I think it makes sense for some films. I think the way Warner Brothers went about it was all wrong. And I do think it's a uh, a pretty cold calculated move by AT&T versus Warner Brothers being like, we love HBO Max. Right. I mean, you have to understand that AT&T is not in the business of cinema. They could not care less. Uh, what they see as eight for HBO Max is a way to basically sell you AT&T. So, for instance, you may have seen commercials for for AT&T Fiber or AT&T, other AT&T products that are also selling HBO Max. And that's the idea that they've basically said, hey, if you sign up for our you know, data service, we'll throw in HBO Max as, as a sweetener. So they're not really trying to sell you HBO Max. I mean, they want, I mean, they need it to generate revenue and obviously they want you to get it even if you're not an AT&T subscriber. But for AT&T, it's a good way to sort of get more people into their telecom business. It's that's the that's the plan here. Um, they, I will say, Warner Media is correct for 2021 in the sense of what you said. We just don't know what COVID's going to look like in the new year. Uh, vac- how vaccinations will roll out, and when will people feel safe going back to theaters? Like you may get a vaccine, um, but you know we. How many people will be vaccinated? You know, when will people be feel comfortable going back to crowded spaces? That's all uncertain. And when will theaters, you know, be able to reopen? And and especially some like AMC, which are running low on cash, how are they gonna like where, you know, will how will that distribution model be affected? So there's a lot of questions here that for Warner Media, they're hedging by putting it on HBO Max. And I do think it's a smart hedge for 2021 in the face of COVID. I do think it's a smart decision. And I think uh, it's a little embarrassing for Christopher Nolan that you know he has never once acknowledged COVID <laughs> in anything that he's done. He's never said, oh, we have a safety problem here. He's always been like ride or die for th- the theatrical experience. And I'm like, there's a there's a pandemic, my brother. So, <laughs> you know, like, what are you, what are you gonna do? So I feel like Warner Media has made the correct decision for 2021, but because Warner Brothers has always had a rich history of shooting themselves in the dick. They did it in the worst way possible, which is that they just kind of announced it without any buy-in or announcement or how are we going to pay all these people and just said, we're doing it. And now there's blowback. So I feel like it's the right decision made in the wrong fashion. Yeah, and we should also note, like, these movies are not going to just be on HBO Max in perpetuity. So they're doing this thing where it'll be on. So this is happening starting with Wonder Woman 1984. It will go on HBO Max on Christmas Day, and it will be there for 30 days. But after 30 days, it will disappear. It will not be on HBO Max anymore. And then it will follow a traditional window. So it'll have, and I don't know how quickly this will happen. They haven't really said, but it'll have, you know, a digital, like, a, or first, I think, a PVOD release. So you'll pay a premium if you want to rent it to watch it. And then there'll be a digital release and a Blu-ray release and a DVD release. And then eventually it'll go on HBO Max um, if the you know production companies behind the film have not already made deals with other streaming services. So these are all like 30 day windows for each of these films. But it's just absolutely wild to me that like Matrix 4 will be on HBO Max <laughs> while it's also in theaters. Uh, it's just kind of insane. Yeah, it's, you know, again, it's on the other. On, and I again. It's it's not realistic for Warner Brothers to be like, well, we'll just, you know, keep all of our movies on the shelf and just hope for the best. Like, that's just not realistic for any business. Like, that's their product. That's what they're hoping to put out. And just sort of doing this thing. Well, okay, we'll announce a release date. And then three months later, change the release date again and again and again. That's not really saving theaters any more than, you know, than doing this current hybrid plan. Because yeah. you still can't release the movies. Like at the end of the day, there's still this COVID problem that has to be considered. And Warner Media is a business; they have to stay in business, so they have to release these movies somehow. And so this is sort of the best of the bad options. They just went about it in a really wrong-headed fashion. I'm really curious to see the consumer response, like especially with Dune. So that's October of next year. Mm-hmm. God willing, everyone who wants a vaccine will be vaccinated <clears throat> at that point. Um, and I'm curious to see how many people go to see it in a theater versus just 
who are those who are content to sit back and watch it at home. You had a really good tweet that was like, we didn't just stay home and watch movies this year because we wanted to. <laughs> like, we hated it. Like, we want to go back to the theater. We want to go have that communal experience. Um, so this idea, uh, this idea that like, you know, I think it was Jason Kalar, the, the new CEO of Warner Media, was kind of like, oh, we're just giving consumers the choice and it's all about consumers and what they want. I'm dubious that the vast majority of people are going to be like, yeah, you know what? I just want to watch Matrix 4 on my couch. Yeah, that's the thing. Like that, the, that's what I've been like. I, it, I'm not someone who thinks streaming is a fad. Um, and I understand like it's a new part of the marketplace that businesses are considering that, that not just considering, but emphasizing. And that's part of the whole Disney thing that we'll get to later in the show. But at the end of the day, like this was not a, oh, we're meeting consumers where they are situation. I mean, I wrote, I wrote a, after this news about HBO Max deal, um, after it dropped, I wrote an editorial saying that this is not really being, this is not really the market's demand. Like you can look at the success of Netflix, but net, look at what Netflix is doing. Netflix for their biggest films is trying to get into theaters, not out of them. They're not trying to shut down theaters. They, you know, were fighting tooth and nail with like AMC to be like, hey, can we get God or, or the Irishman in here for 45 days? And AMC was like, no, it'll never happen. <laughs> and it went yeah. really well for AMC. So, you know, I, I feel like this decision of like, well, we're just going to meet consumers where they are and some folks want, folks want to stay home. And I think sometimes that's true. I think for smaller films, yeah. I think for smaller dramas like indie uh, not even indies because warner brothers really doesn't make indies but like you know you take a let's let's hop over to like fox searchlight uh, or searchlight studios or whatever the hell they're called <laughs> these days searchlight pictures um you take a film like nomadland which i think is lovely and beautiful and i think that a hybrid release strategy is more beneficial for a film like that when people can sort of see that kind of drama on their own time. And I think people yeah. would be willing to watch that kind of drama on their own time. But I think for like, there are movies that are communal experiences more in the way of blockbusters and people like, I don't like, I'm with you. Like the, the idea of like, Hey, do, do you want to see the matrix four by yourself? <laughs> like in your home, won't that be fun? Like, no, I don't really want to. I'll do it if I have to because of COVID. But this is not like, ah, the superior option has arrived. Well, and you think of something like Conjuring 3 and the Conjuring franchise is a bit huge box office wise, uh, whatever you think about those movies. But I mean, the whole like the whole notion of I'm sure you've done this. I've done this where like, all right, we're going to watch a scary movie. Like, let's turn the lights out. Let's get a blanket. Like, it, let's get it as like you are trying to mimic the theatrical experience there. So if Conjuring 3 is in theaters and, H and on HBO Max and you have the vaccine, like, which one are you going to choose? I feel like most people are going to choose to go see it in the theater. Well, so, I also just, yeah, I also just think people are going to, like, choose theaters just because they miss theaters. Like, yes, movies have been a popular art form for a hunt for, like, 100 years now because they are enduring. It's not a fad. Yeah. And we, we've had a home viewing experience for the last few decades now with VHS and then DVD and now streaming. And, like, people do stream and, like, but it's not like attendance in movie theaters completely fell off a cliff. Yeah. You know, people were still going to movies. It's not like, well, I have Netflix now, so why would I ever go to a movie? Um, and I'm not saying like the theatrical experience is perfect. And I do think that if, you know, distributors were smart, they would be investing more and be like, how can we make this experience as good as possible and not be like, hey, people should be on their cell phones because that's <laughs> what they want. Again, this is not like this is a misunderstanding the value you provide. Um, and maybe that'll be a, you know, a, a, a silver lining of this, of, of kind of a whole, like, you know, we are going to give you the theatrical experience. This will not be like your living room. We are going to enforce a no phone strategy and like embracing the whole notion of like, putting on actual pants and going out to a movie theater and paying for overpriced popcorn. Like, I don't know. I, I feel like at the first wave of people going out to theaters, they'd be like, yeah, I, I want to do the thing that I miss. And the thing is, is I don't think there's going to be like, you know, this year we kept being like, what's the film that's going to bring back theaters. And it's like, yeah. that's ridiculous. Uh, because first off we were still, we're still dealing with COVID. So that was yeah. never going to happen. Uh, LOL tenant. Um, but the, I think what's going to happen is it's just going to be gradual. Like yeah. it's not that free guy will bring back movies. It's that, you know, some people will go see free guy and then they'll feel good enough about seeing free guy that they'll see 
you know, Top Gun Maverick. And then, you know, more people like it's just it'll be a gradual return. I do think that, you know, if things go smoothly, I think Black Widow has the potential to just be just this massive thing mm -hmm. like May. But the other thing that I'm really curious about with Warner Brothers is the the filmmaker question, because we've now seen, you know, Nolan has made almost all of his films at Warner Brothers going back to. Is it did he make the prestige at Warner Brothers? He made Insomnia at Warner Brothers. OK, so, well, I, but I think the prestige is at a different studio. Anyway, Warner Brothers is his home studio to the point that when Paramount had Interstellar and was like, do you want to direct it? He was like, yes, but Warner Brothers has to be cut in on the deal. Like, that's how loyal he has been to Warner Brothers. And his statements have been uh, very much being like, I am happy to pack up my knives and go <laughs> elsewhere. Uh, and Denis Villeneuve essentially said the same thing when he said that Warner Brothers, you know, had the opportunity to to have filmmakers backs on this decision when AT&T, you know, because AT&T did this. Uh, when AT&T, you know, May said, you know, how about you guys put stuff on HBO Max? Denis Villeneuve basically said that Warner Brothers didn't have their backs and, you know, it it made him sad. And look at Patty Jenkins. The next movie she's going to make probably is a Disney movie. It's a Star Wars movie. Uh, it's probably not going to be Wonder Woman 3. Um, although Patty Jenkins and Gal, Gal Gadot were cut in on a, a one-time deal with Wonder Woman because I think that thing... The Wonder Woman 1984 thing, reportedly Gal and Patty are getting at least $10 million each to kind of make up for it not getting its theatrical release. Um, and all the other filmmakers of 2021 are not. And I think it's that that was a one time thing because that was their first test case. That was before they had decided they were going to put their entire slate on. Um, but I don't know. I'm rambling now, but I I am curious to see because Warner Brothers has had this reputation of being a haven for filmmakers where they really kind of take care of their directors. And is it just going to be Clint Eastwood? I was going to say, it's just going to be Clint Eastwood <laughs> movies now. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to make things on time and under budget and you can <laughs> put them out. They cost $20 to make and they make yeah. 30. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, does, does Nolan go to Paramount or like, does Nolan go to Disney? I, I think it's highly, he doesn't make R rated movies. I think it's highly possible he goes to Disney. I mean, he'll go wherever they give him the money to. Yeah. I mean, the thing about Nolan, though, is he's not really a franchise guy. And Disney is a very much a franchise studio. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, it's it's I mean, they've they handled this very poorly. And I'm sure from Warner, I'm sure or not Warner Brothers, but AT&T's perspective, it's like creatives are a dime a dozen. You know, they're not. But I'm sure AT&T yeah. is like, you know, business is business. If they leave, we'll get somebody else. We'll just throw a boatload of money at them and we'll get what we want. And it's like, I don't think it works that way. <laughs> Which was the gist of there was a really great reported article in CNBC about kind of the behind the scenes, of what's been going on at AT&T and Warner Brothers and HBO over the past year, um, including, you know, the the former heads of HBO had like presented this plan to AT&T of like, here's what we're going to do. You know, we're going to pump more money in. Uh, we're going to protect creatives. Uh, you know, we're going to do these certain things. And AT&T was like, no, you're going to make a lot more things and you're going to make a lot of stuff for HBO Max and all this other stuff. Um, and in, in that reported article, I, I don't know, I think it was really fascinating because it kind of gave you some insight into how. Like, I think it was floated to, like, put ads on HBO, which I think would just be ruinous to that brand because HBO's whole thing is no ads. So, like, what are you no, doing there? Yeah. I mean, again, you're asking a bunch of telecom guys, hey, what do you think about art? Yeah. Like, they don't fucking know. They know how to lay fiber optic cable. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> that's what they know. How, they know a 5G data plan. Like, that's yeah. what they know. Like, if you ask them, you know, how should we run you know, an entertainment division, they don't know, but for them, it's just content and the content is there to support the data plans. And I say this as someone who loves HBO Mac. I think it has the best film library of any streaming service, um, largely due to their deal with TCM, but they just have a bunch of movies from the eighties and seventies and sixties and fifties on there that Netflix doesn't have and stuff. And their originals I think are pretty good too. So I'm a fan of HBO Max. I'm just not a fan of how they're how AT&T is handling this whole thing. Yeah, I'm not a fan of how they're taking care of their business. It's not it has nothing to do with sort of the content. Um, but I also feel like content wise, they're kind of screwing up already. You can kind of see this this approach with the docu series that they've done. Like the fact that the vow ran for nine episodes, that was dumb. And well, now, that was HBO, and HBO I mean, has always had a problem with that. That wasn't I mean, HBO Max. That wasn't that was HBO, HBO Max thing, because no, now, that was now HBO I'm seeing, like, films. Heaven's Gate, Cult of Cults, and I'm like, a four-part docuseries. And it's well, that's like, a CNN production, 
So like yeah. they're separate, like they're made by different entities and stuff. But I get well, what you're never saying. Never mind me. <laughs> they're the content strategy is sound. <laughs> It's fine. I, I think I liked Love Life and I've heard really good things about the flight attendant. Um, I like that they're letting Steven Soderbergh make movies there. That's fun. So, yeah, that's nice. His current yeah. movies on a, on his on a cruise ship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm not, you know, I think the question is like, are, oh, theaters are dead. And I just don't I don't I haven't bought that argument just because I haven't seen anything that makes me believe that people would reject the theatrical experience, the communal, any, any more than, you know, oh, well, we get all our food from takeout now. Why would there be restaurants? Yeah, like, just because Grubhub exists doesn't mean restaurants went extinct. Yeah, like just because there is a new way to do something that doesn't, and, you know, it doesn't automatically kill off what came before because they offer different things. Yeah. Well, and I think proof positive of that is Disney's uh, presentation where yeah. it wasn't like they were. I mean, they announced a ton of things for Disney Plus, but their biggest movies were exclusively in theaters. Right. Exactly. And if you look at the scheduling today, like they're not like they didn't say like, oh, or, you know, the Kingsman and Free Guy and Death on the Nile. Those are coming to Hulu, you know, like, yeah. no, they said, no, they're just we're changing the dates and they'll go to, into movie theaters. Yeah. Um, you know, Disney is very much like streaming is a huge part of our business model from now on. And I think that's smart. I think if you want to compete with Netflix, you definitely you unfortunately do need 10 Star Wars series. Yes. <laughs> um, it sounds crazy, but you do need it if you're going to compete with Netflix. Um, but 18, I mean, not 18, Disney, which is not trying to sell telecom plans, knows that like their business model works better when there's a theatrical component that people can rally around. Yeah. Um, and it's also just easier when there's a theatrical component, because you have to keep in mind, like Disney doesn't just sell the movie. Disney sells everything. So if you're releasing Black Widow, like you're not just releasing Black Widow, you're also releasing Black Widow action figures and Black Widow bed sheets and like Black Widow clothes. And then like there's the there's the the DVD and the Blu-ray and the digital copy and the and all the ancillary streams of revenue. If the you merch just at the theme parks. Right. If you just dump it on Disney Plus, that's really not your best option. That's not really what you want to do. You'll do it if you have to, but mm -hmm. at no point has Disney seemed completely like, ah, this is our future. They've taken it one film at a time. Yeah. They've said with Mulan, like we'll do it with Mulan. And clearly Mulan was not a huge thing for them because they did no. not. Because for Soul, they're like, okay, this one's free. Have this one on us. Uh, and Soul is a is a better film than Mulan. I know it hasn't come out yet, but it's just it is. Um, and then like, but then they are doing the premiere access thing again with Raya and the Last Dragon. But it, it, it's not the like this is just how it's gonna be now. Thirty dollars to see our movie early on Disney Plus because that's just not workable for them. Yeah, here's how I know Mulan's not a big deal. It's on uh, Disney Plus right now. <laughs> and, like, no one's talking about it. Like, didn't it go on Disney Plus like a week ago or something? Oh, for free? Yeah. I guess so. I, I didn't even know. <laughs> I didn't funny. even know. <laughs> yeah. It's on Disney Plus right now. If you go to Disney Plus, it's right there. It's in your library. You can watch it whenever you want. Uh, and nobody's talking about it. So clearly that wasn't a super, you know, successful strategy. And they have announced that, like, uh, Peter Pan and Wendy is a live action film going to Disney Plus. Cruella, I think, is going to Disney Plus. Pinocchio is going to Disney Plus. But Little Mermaid is still going to be theatrical. Lion King 2 is going to be theatrical in terms of their live action remakes. Um, didn't they announce? No, I mean, they didn't announce like, it. They didn't announce it, but like, I'm sure like the next Pirates of the Caribbean will probably be theatrical. Like, yeah. They're not abandoning that strategy. I mean, again, if you watched that presentation yesterday, and unfortunately, everyone at Collider had to. <laughs> <laughs> it, was it was so long. It was long and it was terrible. <laughs> um, you'll notice like even Marvel, like Kevin Feige was mostly talking about Disney Plus straight, like Disney Plus shows. Yeah. He was largely talking about like what they're bringing to Disney Plus. Like, he was like, yeah, you know, you have Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings and here's a bit about Black Panther 2 and here's a bit about uh, Black Widow and here's a bit about Doctor Strange 2. But for the most part, he was like, no. And like we have Moon Knight and we have Miss Marvel and we have like, you know, they were talking up the shows. And Marvel's Disney Plus strategy seems super smart because they're not doing 13 episode or like, you know, even 10 episode. These are six episode 
essentially long movies. And I know I hate the like, you know, my TV show is actually a long movie. But if you think about it, it's Marvel Studios who up until now has only made movies. And now they are literally just making long movies. So it doesn't it make perfect sense to do Secret Invasion as a six or eight episode limited series like event and funnel a bunch of money into that versus trying to make, you know, a two part Avengers Secret Invasion movie that's going to take you three years to finish. And there's only so many movies you can release into theaters. Yeah. That's the other thing. Like they could make like, Oh, why didn't you just, if, if you know, the Falcon and the winter soldier is just a six episode movie, why didn't you just make a movie? And it's like, because there's nowhere on the schedule for it. Yeah. Like we and already people have, aren't going to sit in theaters for six hours. Well, not just, yeah, but even if them. you were, even if you were to condense it, like yeah. next year is going to have three Marvel movies, going to have black widow, Shang Chi and Eternals. But like Disney has a bunch of other films like you have to fit into Disney's slate and Disney has had. Let's see, there's one picture is next year, too, right? It's supposed to be next year. Yeah. Yeah. Next. I mean, yeah, I always think of Spider-Man as Sony, but you're right. It is Marvel. But it's weird because they didn't mention they couldn't mention Spider-Man or Disney. He like briefly he briefly noted that it would uh, tie into Doctor Strange. or something. Right. Which we all kind of already know because they're going to the other (laughs) Spider-Man franchises. But. He did not mention Venom, too, and I'm upset. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the real big question is, what will happen with Morbius? Yes, that's what's on everyone's mind. What will happen with Morbius? And this is why the fans are truly clamoring to know what's going on with Morbius. I want to take this opportunity to announce on the Collider podcast that I'm starting my own website called (laughs) MorbiusWatch.com. And every day we'll tell you, is Morbius in theaters yet? (laughs) (laughs) That movie. So, yeah, I feel like, um, you know, it's if you're someone who's like theaters are dead, I think that's an oversimplification and it kind of misreads the landscape. Yeah. Um, I also wouldn't shortchange, you know, obviously streaming is is becoming more of a factor, but we're not just streaming will have to compete as it always does. You know, I mean, you know, yes, Netflix is a juggernaut, but not every Netflix show is a hit. Yeah they kind of flood the zone and now they were flooding the zone to sort of create market dominance. And unfortunately, I don't think they've achieved it in the way that they hoped. And now they're going to have to compete. And I do think that there will be streaming services that do not survive like they're just, or they will be folded into other streamers. So like, if you ask me like right now in December of 2020, I don't think Peacock is going to make it. <laughs> Because I think Peacock is bad. I don't think people want a confusingly tiered system that kind of has ads and like even the movies have ads and it doesn't have a lot in the way of original programming. It's a good you place know? to like bin 30 Rock or, you know, uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine and stuff. But really, that's that's the only thing I use it for. And the right. Bob Ross channel. Right. And Amber it's, Ruffin show, which is good. Yeah, it's not that it's and that's the thing. It's not like Peacock is all bad. But can Peacock can compete with Disney Plus? Yeah. I don't know. It's, you know, HBO Max can compete. Um, but I definitely think Warner Media is going to have a problem on their hands with the way that they announced and dealt with this HBO Max situation. I also just think that like there's nothing that could compare to like a big box office hit, be it a massive Marvel movie or a word of mouth hit. Uh, like you think about Extraction, which is supposedly the biggest Netflix movie in history. Um, like, I don't, I don't know, like, that, are people still talking about it? Is it a thing that, like, popped into the zeitgeist beyond Chris Hemsworth will, punching a bunch of children? I will of give you $20. I will Venmo you $20 if you can tell me the name of Chris Chris Hemsworth's character in Extraction. I think it's something to do with Rake, but that's only because I had to write stuff up. About <laughs> <it>. <laughs> something to do with Rake does not count. <laughs> but that's but my that's, point. Like, it's not like a memorable character in a memorable story. It was like we were all quarantined and <laughs> we were like, oh, this is on. Yeah. And so that's the thing. Like, it doesn't, I don't know, the competition and the incentives are different um, in times of COVID. And it feels like all of these studios are funneling a ton of money into streaming services because that's where they see the future is. And they have to justify spending that much money on those streaming services by saying, well, we're going to put these big movies on there, knowing full well that the, the profit, the profits of a movie going straight to HBO Max is not going to be the same as the profits of putting that exclusively in theaters. Like Godzilla versus Kong would, you know, lowball it maybe like three, four hundred million dollars, but that's more than you're going to get from the subscriber uptick in HBO Max. Right, and that's before you have to like pay, you know, Legendary their share. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the. I mean, see, that's that's the thing. Like, I feel like 
you know, you can, you can make all these predictions about, you know, oh, you know, our streaming future, but really like the incentives have changed, you know? So I, I feel I think, like, yeah, I think a good example, and I'm looking it up now because I want to get it right. Um, but a, a kind of, to me, a perfect example is a quiet place. So like you put that movie on Netflix, it's a word of mouth hit. It kind of goes away in the ether. That movie costs I had like tops $21 million and it made $340 million at the box office. But in making that much money at the box office, it like infiltrated the zeitgeist. People were talking about it. People were curious about it. You kept seeing ads for it on television. Whereas the half-life of these streaming movies is like one weekend and you're done. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like we can sort of, you know, bemoan the monoculture all we want, but people do want things to rally around. They want something yeah. to kind of talk about. They like, even if it's something dumb like Tiger King, you know, when we were all quarantined, like people want something that they can all kind of share in. And I think yeah. movies where you have to go out and pay your money and like give it a shot, people want that. And that is something I've seen is that the things that do have staying power on streaming services uh, by and large appear to be shows, either yes. be they limited series or long running shows. So like The Queen's Gambit is a perfect example. You know, Scott Frank describes that as a seven hour movie because he wrote and directed everything and like he he didn't necessarily direct him as episodes or whatever, but like that thing is still in the zeitgeist a month after it was released on Netflix. But can you name the last Netflix movie that did that? <laughs> like I liked the old guard, but the old guard was like old news by two weeks in. Well, I mean, it was, it was old news by the time it came out. Like it yeah. just didn't, it just didn't hit. And that's the other thing. Like last in our last episode, we talked about how, you know, Netflix, like, you know, teaming with David Fincher on his first film in six years. No one saw Mank. <laughs> yeah, nobody watched it. It's right there. You can watch it. You can watch it right now, but Man no one saw Mank. And like this, what, I think on Netflix right now is The Prom. But yeah. like, is anyone going to talk about The Prom? I feel like The Prom could be a thing. We'll the see. Prom it came could out today. Be a thing? Yeah. yeah. But the, it, it's, a. I think it, so it costs you nothing to click on something. Like, I, this was a thing like to go way back of like getting Netflix discs. How many times did like you probably like me had like the three or four discs at a time thing. And you always had that one movie that always sat there that you were like, I'm going to watch it, but not today. I'm yeah. going to watch it, but not today. But like if Mank is in theaters and you know, it's only going to be in theaters for maybe three or four weeks, depending on how well it does. It's like, well, I, I want to see it. So we're going to go this weekend. Like you make the effort to go out and see it. If you're doing, if that makes any sense, it feels like no, when it costs you nothing, it's easier. matters. Yeah, when it costs you nothing, when it's always there on Netflix, I feel like there's so many movies on my queue that I'm just like, I'll get around to it someday. Right. Well, you know, and that's the thing, like all the movies sitting in your queue, you scroll for a while and you're like, fuck it, put on The Office. Yeah. yeah. And now they're about to lose The Office. But thankfully, they have Space Force. <laughs> yes. They have 10 episodes of Space Force. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I well, feel DVDs, like, folks. yes, things... <laughs> I feel like things are going to change, but not as radically or as drastically as some are predicting. Like, yes, the HBO Max, you know, news made waves for a reason, but I don't think that it, just because it made waves, it's a, you know, paradigm shift in the entire industry. Yeah. Because if it were, uh, yeah. if it were like Disney would have probably followed up being like these movies are now coming to Hulu and they didn't do that. It did open a door that studios have been trying to open for a decade now that they started mm -hmm. with Tower Heist was the first. Oh, man, I remember reporting <laughs> on that. Holy yeah, shit. That was a disaster. Um, it did finally open that door. But I think and I think the filmmakers know it. If they put enough pressure, they're going to get these studios to not, you know, just full on put everything on their streaming services all the time. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think that's sort of the next wave of contracts is going to sort of you know, be like, how are you releasing my movie? Yeah. Yeah. And like stipulations, like if you decide to change course, I get X amount of money. Right. So, yeah, I feel like that's sort of what's happening with streaming right now. Yeah. So to answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, let's move on to recently watched. Uh, Adam, what have you seen lately? Uh, so I recently watched a movie I had never seen before um, and had always meant to watch it. And finally, the time felt right. Uh, watched It's a Wonderful Life, which is a good movie. I'll say it. I'm not afraid to say Hot it. Hot take. It's a good movie. <laughs> it's a very good movie. Um, yeah, our own uh, Greg Smith wrote a really great essay about it recently about the darkness of the film. And, you know, people kind of jumped on a tweet without reading the essay. But um, it's true. I was, a, you know, it's one of those movies that like, 
it's kind of like I saw Mafia before I saw The Godfather, so I like knew I had seen the parody before I saw the real thing, so I kind of knew the beats. So I kind of knew the beats of this movie, but it was still kind of surprising to me. But it, it like I was really struck by how emotional I was uh, by the end of that film, and I also kind of like the notion that like it doesn't end with uh, Mr. Potter getting his comeuppance. Like it's just kind of like it's enough for good people to be good. Um, whereas today you would have to have a scene where like, you know, um, he dies. <laughs> yeah, he dies or like gets put in jail and like everything is put together in a neat bow, but it's not, it's George Bailey's story and it, it matters what George Bailey feels and what he cares about. Um, and that ending is so cheesy, but also so rousing. Um, it makes I me found, cry. yeah, <laughs> it's, it's super emotional. It's it, and it's just so well done and it doesn't, it's not as emotional if you haven't gone through what you've just gone through with him, um, kind of witnessing his story. Uh, one thing I was surprised, I thought the entire story was what it looked like if he wasn't there, but it then like turns out that's just the last act of the movie. Essentially, <laughs> it's not a huge part of the film. You're really getting his life story and stuff. Um, but yeah, I will say it resonates tremendously well. Uh, and it, you know, it's a classic for a reason. Well, you know, it's funny. It's a classic for a reason. And it was not a hit upon its no. release. Um, and it was really only because it got, kept getting played at Christmas time on television. Yeah. So, you know, let that be a lesson to be like, well, if a film, you know, is is not a hit, you know, It's a Wonderful Life is kind of a cult hit. It did yeah. not it did not succeed in its initial theatrical release, uh, much to the chagrin of, of Frank Capra. That does bring to mind it not to like circle back. But Steven Soderbergh has made this point many times, which I think is the smart thing to do, which is that if your movie opens on a Friday and, you know, on Friday, it's going to bomb. He says he wants the ability to put that on streaming as quickly as possible. So you ride that wave of the marketing push that you put towards the theatrical release. And if you're seeing that no one is going to it and it's going to be pulled from theaters in three weeks, immediately get that thing on one of like on the studio streaming services. That way you're riding the wave of whatever marketing push has been put out. No, I think that's that's I think that's super smart. And it's it's financially uh, it's financially smart because yeah. you've already paid for the marketing. Like yeah. why blow it? Just turn it to, you know, Logan lucky now on HBO yeah. max or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Um, my recently watched, um, is I saw, I watched yesterday. I watched Kelly Reichardt's first cow. Um, and I hadn't seen a Reichardt film since Meek's cutoff. And Meek's cutoff is like, I respect what this is doing, but this is also very slow and I don't really feel that engaged with it. But maybe I'll feel differently about First Cow. And I didn't. Um, the story is very sweet. It's about these two, these guys on the, on the frontier, um, the American frontier, and they, um, one knows how to cook and the other sort of... Uh, sounds rousing. <laughs> The other is sort of more business minded and a nearby wealthy person has a cow. So at night they sneak onto the land and milk the cow, steal its milk to make small cakes and then they sell them. This is it's really story. about their friendship. Uh, sounds I don't so know. Man, people, some people go freaking nuts for Kelly Reichardt film. And the thing yeah. is, like, I won't say she's a bad director. I don't think she is. But what she is laying down, I am not picking up. Yeah. I just feel like, you know, her shot selection, the the pacing of her films, um, they're not doing it for me. Even though I think, like, you know, First Cow has something really nice to say about friendship and something really dark to say about American capitalism. Ultimately, I feel like it just didn't like I have no desire to ever revisit that movie. And it's sort of like it's kind of in a way like a parody of what people like of people who don't see independent film. Like they think this is what all independent film is. Yeah. And it's not. But like it is very indie in its bones. But I also feel like it's not really the best that independent cinema has to offer. I'm sure some people feel very differently. And. I get where they're coming from, but yeah, I think at this point I can, I can say that Kelly Reichardt is not for me. Yeah. That's kind of why I've been putting off watching that film. <laughs> it was yeah. exactly what you described. Um, but there's still a lot on my catch up list before I make my end of the year list. Which yeah. I'm, I'm going to Christmas is in two weeks. I have no idea. Yeah. I'm kind of now starting to plow my way through, um, the small acts series, which you lied to me. They are long movies. Are they? <laughs> it's two hours and seven minutes. Oh, I thought they were like 50 minutes. No, that's mangrove is like two hours and seven minutes. <laughs> Lover's Rock is like 80 minutes. 
<laughs> so, so you started Mangrove and you're like, all right. And then you're like, this is pretty. Uh, I mean, I'm now here's the thing. Mangrove, video. and I'll say it since we're doing the show now anyway. Mangrove is really good. Like if you yeah. thought Trial of Chicago 7 was good, definitely seek out Mangrove because it's better uh, in terms of like dealing with protest movements and like a courthouse mm-hmm. drama. But um, yeah, they're not short films. <laughs> but I'm going yeah, to make my way through it. I need to make my way through those. I need to see Sound of Metal, uh, News of the World, One Night in Miami. Got a lot on my list. I need to see Bloodshot. Oh. <laughs> you should see Dude, Bloodshot. I'm going to see Bloodshot. <laughs> all right. Do what you want. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, as we said in our last episode, we're for the rest of the year, we're doing two podcasts a week uh, till the end of the year. Uh, we're so excited to be back. And this podcast is now pretty much wherever you get your podcast, you can find the Collider podcast. We are on everything now under our new deal with Megaphone, and we're very excited about it. So please check it out. Uh, if you want to keep up with what we're talking about, you can follow us on Twitter. Adam, where can we find you on Twitter? At Adam Chitwood. You can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, next week, our first episode of the week, we will be talking about the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit trilogy, because we watched those on 4K. And so we're excited to, to talk about those films again. Uh, so thanks for listening, and we'll be back with you next week.